Life Audio. I think sometimes we look at God's sovereignty through the lens of judgment. And while that's true, and we certainly see a God who intervenes and we deal with his judgment when we have been disobedient, whether that is personally or corporately as a body of Christ or even as a country, but we also have to remember that part of God's sovereignty is blessing. And that's the primary way that he wants to interact with humanity. The judgment portion is because it's a consequence of, of our actions. But this idea of blessing should be part of this idea of sovereignty. So we're going to get into that and more today. Stay tuned. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are reading through Psalm 94. And if you're just joining us, we're doing a devotional reading through one psalm a day. And the reason why we're doing that is because essentially the Psalms was the hymn book and prayer book of Jesus and the disciples. And in fact, he references, they reference the book of Psalms more than any other Old Testament book. And so if it's important for Jesus to read and understand, it's important for us to read and understand. Amen. So if you're just joining us and you haven't been going through the Psalms with us, I just want to let you know about a couple resources we have for you. Every Monday, I send out a newsletter that has a journaling prompt that goes with each of these current episodes. And journaling, I have found, is just an easy way to help you get the information from your head and into your heart. Again, that goes out every Monday. You can sign up at shehears.org for that. And then if you would like previous journaling prompts for the previous episodes that are not the current episodes. We right now have one book out. We're having a second book come out pretty soon. Um, But Psalm 1 through 50 is available right now on our website. It's only $5. And what that is, is a guided journal that includes the journaling prompt, the key verse for the day, and then some space to journal. And you can either print that out and use that. You can use it on a device or something similar. Pretty soon, about, what is it, six more days, we'll have the second set, which is Psalm 51 through 100 available as well. And then when we finish the entire Psalms, we're going to have all 150 chapters together in a print um, book available for you too. But again, it's just another way to help you process the information because the goal, you know, my goal is not to replace your Bible reading, but my goal is to supplement it. And so, um, if you just listen to the podcast and then nothing changes in your life, we're not meeting that goal. The goal really is for for you to understand or have a better understanding of God's character and God's nature because this whole process, the Hearing Jesus podcast, as you heard in the intro every day, is really to help you understand how to hear God's voice more clearly. And we know that God's word is the primary way he speaks to us. And so that's why we're digging into the scriptures the way that we are. So I'm reading from the NIV and Psalm 94, starting at verse one. O Lord, the God who avenges, O God who avenges, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth, pay back to the proud what they deserve. How long will the wicked, O Lord, how long will the wicked be jubilant? They pour out arrogant words. All the evildoers are full of boasting. They crush your people, O Lord. They oppress your inheritance. They slay the widow and the alien. They murder the fatherless. They say the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob pays no heed. Take heed, you senseless ones, among the people. You fools, when will you become wise? Does he who implanted the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Does he who disciplines nations not punish? Does he who teaches man lack knowledge? The Lord knows the thoughts of man. He knows that they are futile. 
Blessed is the man you discipline, O Lord, the man you teach from your law. You grant him relief from the days of trouble till a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. Judgment will again be founded on the righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord has given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, was supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Can a corrupt throne be allied with you? One that brings on misery by its decrees. They band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my fortress and my God, the rock in whom I take refuge. He will repay them for their sins and destroy them for their wickedness. The Lord our God will destroy them. So as we're looking at this psalm, we have to remember that the backdrop of book four of the psalms, remember there's five natural divisions that we already have in the psalms, we're in book four. The backdrop of that period of time was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And so this psalm would be termed a community lament or an individual lament. And the lament prayers we spent a considerable amount of time on Um, But what it does is it's sounding this urgency for God to really come out shining forth as the God who will not let injustice take over and rule. Injustice and brutality and wickedness and all the things that they were experiencing at that time frame is not something that we are ignorant of in our world. And in fact, it feels like in some ways we're experiencing that in, in in a really fresh or maybe increasing way in recent years. And those are all reasons that as God's people, we need to continue to pray in order to stop the progress of evil. We have to pray through that opportunity and really expose wickedness for what it is. Um, I think sometimes it can feel overwhelming when we're faced with just over and over and over and over just stories of injustice and, and wickedness around the world and the temptation and what the enemy would have you believe is that, well, me sitting here at my kitchen table with my Bible, I, I really can't do much about that. Um, but yet we know from scripture that we can, and in fact, we're called to, we're called to pray about those situations. So you know, for me, what that means is when I see something on the news or I read about something online, instead of settling to this place of maybe apathy or just um, disgust or just a desperate plea, you know, I think sometimes we have this uh, response where we can say, okay, God, just come soon, get me out of here. But instead, what we're called to do as believers is to stand up when in the face of injustice and at the very least we can pray, but we can also fight to uncover the truth of that situation and to speak out and, and defend the cause of those that are going through such injustices. Jesus states um, in Luke, and then also we read about in revelations that his people should cry out day and night. He says to God, so that they might be able to get justice and get justice quickly. We read that in Luke chapter 18. And so the condition of the world should make us pray regularly, of course, for Christ's return and for this time that he's going to destroy this evil and rule the earth in peace and there will be justice and there will be righteousness. But even though we know that's coming, we still have to deal with what's here right now. And the reality is, is we may see the return of Jesus in our lifetime. We may not. I mean, we have to reconcile that the disciples thought that they were going to see Jesus return in their lifetime. So even though we have this sense of urgency or this longing to see Jesus return, that doesn't mean that we're silent and inactive in the meantime. Instead, we fight on his behalf in the meantime. I think sometimes the struggle here Anytime we're seeing injustice, um, anytime that there is human suffering or this injustice is an issue in the world, whether it is in the Old Testament, like we see this here or in our own lives, it, it does give us this obstacle to deal with when we talk about God's sovereignty. And one of the things, like I said, at the outset of this episode is that 
we have to recognize there's two sides to God's sovereignty. Yes, there is him dealing with injustices, but there's also a sense of blessing. And sometimes it's hard to see both of those, especially when we're in the middle of a mess, really. And so what we see in this passage is there is this oppressive behavior from from the wicked. And the bottom line of injustice is evidenced by the fact that there is injustice throughout the scriptures, like Old Testament, New Testament, and from the time it was written all the way till now. And so what we know is it's a tactic of the enemy for sure. It's it's one of the ways that the enemy tries to silence God's people and people in general to keep this barrier between people and God. But it's also evidence of the fact that we live in a fallen world. We We were not made for the brokenness of this world. We were made to be in restored right relationship with God. But yet, sometimes these injustices keep us either physically because we're the ones that are suffering or emotionally because we have um, a hard time even understanding how a good God could allow such a thing or even spiritually where we stay silent and we don't fight for the cause of, of the weak and the broken and the hurting. And so as we look through this passage, those are the couple of things I want to point out. I actually think we're going to take a little bit of a break right now. And when we come back, we'll get into the rest of this psalm. Stay tuned. So it can feel kind of confusing to talk about this idea of the Lord's discipline alongside of the Lord's blessing when it comes to the sovereignty of God. And and I understand that. I think um, if we think about Paul and Paul's point in Romans where he talks about Um, In chapter two, he talks about this topic. We have to recognize that God's primary mode of how he governs his people is to bless us. And God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance, to right relationship with him. And so God's judgment is the alternate mode of how he operates, but not his preferred mode. And I think about this in terms of my own children. For those of you that are parents, I discipline my children because I love my children. And my motivation for disciplining them is love. Why? Well, if my daughter is mouthing off to me, I know that if she is allowed to get away with that kind of behavior and she replicates that elsewhere, there will be severe consequences, much more severe than if I were to deal with it in the home. If she were to do that in school, she would likely get in trouble with her teachers or get you know, detention. If she were to do that in the workplace, she she could get fired. And so because I care about her, if she were to do that in her relationships, she could lose a friendship or a romantic relationship down the road. If I care about her and I care about her outcome, I care about her, the way that she's going to be able to live her life. If I know that God has a certain plan for how she is to behave within the world or even what the world standard is culturally, what's acceptable and unacceptable, then I'm going to intervene when I see that behavior because I love her. And I think that is the lens that we need to look at God's discipline through. The word that is translated as discipline not only has implications of rebuking or correction, but it also has this positive implication of training and guiding and instruction and just like as a loving parent, I'm going to give those kinds of things to my daughters. That's what helps them mature into adulthood. And in the same way, when God disciplines us as believers, that's what helps us to mature spiritually. God's discipline can feel difficult when it's happening. And depending on our spiritual maturity, we can usually respond in a couple of ways. And I think about this in terms, again, of our human relationships. In the moment when I discipline one of my children, that doesn't feel good for them. It doesn't make them want to be close to me. In fact, it makes them want to go away from me. Um, But usually what happens is after a little bit of time has happened and they have had time to process what has happened, 
we will often revisit that experience together and we will have a conversation about it. And sometimes they'll even thank me. Or there's been times where, like my one daughter, she would say, you know, mom, why didn't you, why didn't you tell me or why didn't you intervene sooner? And, and you know, there's, there's a fine line where sometimes we allow the kids de- to deal with the consequences, the natural consequences of their choices. And sometimes we intervene. It depends on, um, is it going to be a learning experience for them? It depends on if they're going to hurt themselves or hurt someone else. You know, that, that all kind of takes some wisdom in parenting, but my point with that is there are times where my daughters will say, man, you should have stopped me. They appreciate that di- that discipline because they know it's coming from a place of love. When we do that with God, sometimes we can make light of the discipline and just pretend like it didn't even happen. Um, I've, I've had a tendency to just even act that way. Like I will know that God is disciplining me or intervening and I just pretend like I don't hear him and I just do my own thing anyway. And then I feel terrible afterwards and I, of course, repent and ask God's forgiveness. But I ignore his warning or his caution. Um, And I think we we do that with our human relationships too. And then sometimes we can also be super sensitive when we respond and lose heart and feel like God doesn't love us. And that's absolutely absolutely not the case. Um, And so the caution is not to withdraw emotionally or not to give up. Because those responses are not an indicator of what what God's outcome, ideal outcome would be for us. The ideal outcome would be for us to recognize God's discipline as love for us. And even for us to understand that when we when we go through seasons of discipline in our lives, God is close. God is near. It's not like he just hands out discipline and disappears from our lives. He doesn't go anywhere. And so in those moments where we're feeling the weight of that, we can also be comforted knowing that he's right there. In verse 9, it says, Does he who implanted the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? You know, we have to remember that while this is explaining human senses, our senses are a copy of God's senses because we're made in his image. And certainly he can use his ears and his eyes just like we can. And he, he knows, I mean, God is omniscient, meaning he knows what's going on everywhere at every time. And so sometimes I think um, we forget that God has this ability to understand what's going on in his world and the hidden sin that we have in our lives is not hidden from him. Even if we succeed in hiding our sin from our closest relatives, our family members, our closest friends, our church, our pastor, our small group, our employer, all of those things that you think are hidden, he sees. And, and sometimes the way that God deals with those things is through discipline. And my hope is that when that happens, we can recognize it and respond to it, even if it feels hard, even if it makes us want to withdraw a little bit, even if it gets us to a place where emotionally it feels yucky. I mean, I, I that's the only way I can describe it is when I have gone through seasons like that, I feel separated from God. And, and we know that sin separates us from God. But yet we have a God who really wants to be in right relationship with us. That's the whole point. That's why he sent Jesus. And and I, um, I, I had, I do life coaching. If you need a life coach or want to do spiritual direction, you can find that on my website. But I had somebody reach out to me not too long ago and I won't name the sin, but she said, I feel like I have a sin that's not forgivable. And she has lived and carried this with her. And I'm going to say to her, say to you what I said to her, because I think it was kind of um, eye-opening for her. I said, you know, God knew that we were going to mess up. That's why we needed Jesus. And the only time that sin is unforgivable is when we don't ask for forgiveness. And it may feel like it's harder to forgive ourselves 
than it is to for, for God to forgive us. But yet that's kind of the whole point. The whole point is he sent Jesus to deal with that sin that we struggle with on the cross. And I go into this a lot in the She Hears Bible study. If you haven't picked up a copy of that, you can, you can find that on my website too. But one of the things that we talk about is this idea of how Jesus was the Messiah and what that truly means. And it doesn't mean he's just the deliverer, but, but that name Messiah really means to, he, he can snatch away. And by snatch away, I mean he can take that thing that you're holding on to and deliver us from that thing. And I go into that all, I think it's chapter three or four in the book, but that's my point. Like all of this leads us to recognizing our need for God and, and the injustice that we see either in our lives or in the lives of those around us or in the lives of our culture, those are opportunities to drive us closer to him. Most of this psalm, um, you know, some of this language is really self-explanatory where it talks about discipline and it talks about um, relief and it talks about how God will not reject his people. But then it takes this turn where it really talks about rising up for God against the wicked. And let me read verse 16. It says, who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? So we're really talking about two different things. We're talking about God's discipline in our own lives, but then we're also talking about God's discipline against the wicked and the, those that are oppressing those that cannot speak up for themselves. And so this is kind of a transition in verse 16 where it begins this individual lament prayer where twice the the author, the psalmist, is speaking in the first person um, you know, singular, he's talking about himself. And in the first instance, he speaks about his fate because of what the wicked have done. And in the second instance, he speaks about God's help in his time of trouble. And so the wicked who are immoral and idolatrous and have practiced all sorts of things that are outside of God's law have brought down this Judean kingdom. I think there's a lot of parallels for today, because if you think of even how much the wicked have been pervasive in the American church system. I mean, there's a lot of evil in today's churches. There's a lot of corruption in today's churches. And there is a sense of wickedness. And yet, what is this telling us? This is telling us that God is looking for somebody to rise up against the wicked. When all sorts of sin clouds the body of Christ, the reason why that's able to happen is because many of us stay silent. There was another... It's heartbreaking. There was another church leader that was found to have a moral failure that became public news this week. And as we have seen a steady string of this, and I've, I've talked about this in the Devil is a Narcissist series that I did last year, but as we have seen this steady string over the last couple of years of s- hidden sin being exposed... One of the things I have to think about is how that happened in the first place. And yes, I'm so glad it was exposed. I think the revival that we're seeing um, in the in the generation of college students that we're seeing across the country, um, some, some call it a revival, some call it a spiritual awakening. I think it depends on what your definition of those things are. I think what we're seeing is a spiritual awakening of young people that God is going to use to change this world. But... Usually when you see a move of God like that, it's brought on by repentance. And through that process, things that are hidden become exposed. And so I don't think that the timing of all of this is is coincidental at all. But my point with that is I was on staff for a long time at at a local church. I, I have experienced some of the same things that other people have experienced that that are dealing with with um, things that were once in the dark being exposed to the light. And, And I think of even in like some of the more famous stories that we've heard in the news cycle in the last year or two, like even with Ravi Zacharias and his whole ministry, there were countless people involved that stayed silent. It's in those situations where I think verse 16 hits me. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? 
when, when, especially within the church, when supposed men of God are doing things behind closed doors that are wicked, but yet they're, you know, with, with the, the Zacharias case, he owned massage parlors where he was sexually abusing these young women, but certainly somebody paid his bills. Somebody drove him places. Somebody knew what was going on and they stayed silent. I think about all of the injustice that is allowed to happen because people stay silent. Christians stay silent. So I'm not just talking about in the world, standing up against the wicked in the world. I'm talking about standing up against the wicked within our own, you know, four walls of our churches. And, and while that is hard, the blessing of the sovereignty of God is that we know that we do not do that alone, that we know that his presence goes before us. And so in verse 17, which is right after the verse I, I read, so, so who will rise up against me? Well, then in verse 17, it says, unless the Lord have given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. The answer to that question of verse 16, who's going to rise up against the wicked? It's the one who will rise against the wicked is the Lord. And had the Lord not intervened into Israel's situation, then, then we would have seen, you know, them destroyed. But as today, as we're going through these situations, it says, unless the Lord had given me help, I believe that that means that there's a call to depend on God for wisdom, for a voice to stand up against the wicked. It later talks about how he will repay them for their sins and then even destroy them. I think there, when we read scripture out of context, sometimes people will say, oh, there's so much violence in the Bible. Well, some of it is God dealing with the injustice of, of what was done to his people. Some of it is God dealing with the sin of his people. And so as we reread this, I, I think I want you to do it through the lens of, number one, how has God been disciplining me in my own life? And then also, what might God be calling me to do to stand up against the wicked? Starting back in verse 1. O Lord, the God who avenges, O God who avenges, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth, pay back to the proud what they deserve. How long will the wicked, O Lord, how long will the wicked be jubilant? They pour out arrogant words. All the evildoers are full of boasting. They crush your people, O Lord. They oppress your inheritance. They slay the widow and the alien. They murder the fatherless. They say the Lord does not see. The God of Jacob pays no heed. Take heed, you senseless ones among the people, you fools. When will you become wise? Does he who implanted the ear not hear? Does he who formed the eye not see? Does he who disciplines nations not punish? Does he who teaches man lack knowledge? The Lord knows the thoughts of man. He knows that they are futile. Blessed is the man you discipline, O Lord, the man you teach from your law. You grant him relief from days of trouble till a pit is dug for the wicked. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. Judgment will again be founded on righteousness and all the upright in heart will follow it. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. Can a corrupt throne be allied with you, one that decrees on misery by its decrees? They band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my fortress and my God, the rock in whom I take refuge. He will repay them for their sins, destroy them for their wickedness. The Lord, our God, will destroy them. God, we thank you that you have become our fortress and you are our God, the rock in whom we take refuge. God, in the midst of both dealing with your hand of discipline in our own lives and also the call to rise up against the wicked. Lord, I pray that you would become our fortress, our protection, that like the rock, the cleft of the rock, that you are strong. You are mighty. You offer a protection from this world and from the evil in this world. Lord, I thank you for the way that you deal with injustice and wickedness and that you won't be silent about it so that even 
even in the moments that we see throughout Israel's history, when, when there was no one to stand up against the wicked, that you intervened. God, we thank you for that kind of love. We thank you for the kind of love that continually pursues us. And Lord, help us to have an understanding of your heart for injustice and for making those things right. Lord, help us to that for that to be our heart as well. Lord, I pray for my friends today that you will bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, real quick, before we go, I want to let you know that we have a couple resources available to you. If you are struggling with any of the content that we talk about on the show, or you need a little extra help, or you're seeking some ways to grow spiritually, I do Christian life coaching and spiritual direction. You can find that on the uh, page on my website, shehears.org. Go to the work with me page, and I would love to kind of walk through some of those things with you. Also on the resources page, there's lots of spiritual resources to help you. There are journaling Bibles and note-taking Bibles and Bible studies and all the things. Um, my heart is really to help you grow in a relationship with God. So if those are things that, that you think may be helpful, I'd encourage you to check those out. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call on your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.